green machine. We get hot, it's an icy green. Welcome to uh, maybe the first and last episode of Doc TV uh, and guest here, former rhinoceros and winger for the Brumbies and Wallabies, Clyde Rathbone. Clyde, thanks for coming, mate. Thanks for having me, Ben. And as a South African that's used to having guns pointed at you, mate, I just need to take your temperature first, yeah, mate. Thanks. 36.5, so he's all good. <laughs> all good. So glad to get the, the administrative this side is, of this. The quality of the show is outstanding. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know me, high, yeah, uh, yeah, high yeah. gene levels, mate. Yeah, you know yeah. me, so... Um, yeah, mate, how you been? I know it's been pretty tough for everyone lately, but how Well, you? it's actually, I mean, I think we're relatively unscathed in Canberra uh, compared to lots of other places. So, you know, we, uh, I've been talking to people in New York um, and other parts where the whole COVID stuff seems to be at a whole other level, and I think we're, we're pretty lucky. Chatting to them, those people in New York, are they describing what we're seeing, like, on TV? Is it... Is what we're seeing on TV any sort of fair reflection of what's actually happening? Over well, I mean, the people I'm talking to, um, you know, relatively young, fit, healthy. I think it's more the concerns around the economy. Um, you know, that there are, there's a lot of unanswered questions about opening up the country there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot of very concerned people. How much that concern maps onto how bad it is on the ground, I think is a, it's a case by case thing. It kind of depends who you ask, but if you rely on things like CNN and the, the general media to paint uh, a fairly accurate picture, you might be steered down the wrong way. Just in terms of how alarmist the media is incentivized to be, uh, but it's pretty bad. I think we also don't want to, on, on the flip side of that, you don't want to downplay uh, the numbers. You know, Amer America's had over 80,000 deaths um, that's, those are not insignificant numbers. Um, and places like New York seem to be really badly affected. So, yeah, I, with a couple of our employees are in the US and um, especially early on when things were already ramping up, I think there was a tremendous amount of concern. And now I think it's watered down a bit, but people are still sort of unsure what the next few months are going to look like. So you just said uh, employees that you have uh, in New York. Can you tell the people that don't know what you're up to, so what you're working on and, and your company? That... Yeah, sure. So uh, my brother and I have been working in a startup for a couple of years now. Uh, it's called Letter. Uh, am I staring at you or down the barrel or what's the... No, mate, no, talk to what? Okay. Um, well, you're that way. Oh, yeah, right. It's it's yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's called Letter. It's a place for long-form written dialogue uh, through an exchange of letters. And the idea is that it's a place to figure out what you think about something through conversation. You know, the, the way that a lot of the other online platforms are designed doesn't really encourage thoughtful, nuanced insights into what your positions are, why you think what you think. You don't really get an opportunity to stress test your ideas in conversation with someone else because anyone can interject into a conversation. What makes letter unique as a space online is that anyone can have a conversation with anyone else but once the conversation is initiated it's locked to those two participants in the sense that you can view that conversation all the conversations are public but they're limited to the two people in dialogue and i think what that does is it kind of creates the space for conversation to be more productive than they would otherwise be um, you know we we initially looked at... No arguing or shouting each other down or interrupting? Well, I mean, there's plenty of arguing, um, but it's done in a good faith way. It's done with some rules in place. And those rules aren't explicit rules. They're kind of the same rules that govern conversation in the real world. Like if you and I are having a conversation about something, it would be strange if a member of the public just interjected uh, into that conversation. But it's essentially what happens on Twitter all the time is that anyone can insert themselves into any conversation or Facebook or any of these other platforms. There's no sort of etiquette around how conversation should be conducted. And as a result, you don't tend to see very productive, thoughtful, nuanced conversation emerge from those platforms. And online conversation, I guess, now is more important than ever when we can't, mm. well, we're starting to be able to catch up sort of physically, but since we've all been home, all been quarantined, so the only way we can yeah. catch up is online. Um, I'm a big believer in obviously what you're doing. Can you just explain to everyone, I guess, what the mission behind Letter is, just in sure. maybe a sentence or two? Sure. Um, 
Because yeah. I think it's super important. Yeah, it is. I mean, we do as well. We've dedicated our life to building this company. Um, you know, my brother and I have been doing this for years now, and we're all in because we recognize how important it is. The mission is to advance the quality and impact of conversation. And then that was driven by taking a step back and looking at the state of online discourse. Like why is it that the conversations that we have in person are so much higher quality than the conversations that we tend to have online on social media? And well, why, yeah, why is that then? Well, I think we've touched on one of them. One of, them, one of the reasons is that there's no barrier to entry into a conversation. Anyone can, it's kind of like a public s square that's been amplified. Anyone can say anything to anyone on Twitter, for instance. And there's value in that. I'm not saying that it's all bad, but you know, if Twitter is the public square, then letter is you know, the, the coffee shop or the pub you would go to to have the more thoughtful one-on-one -on -one conversation with the added benefit that that conversation is now public. So it's kind of like a live event where if you or I were on stage having a conversation, there's a viewing audience that are paying attention to what's being said, but aren't participating in that conversation. I think that's really important. I think there's some other re reasons why conversations on letter tend to be of higher quality than on other places. And one of them is that actually putting your thoughts down in writing is a way to improve your arguments and your positions and to actually figure out what you think in that writing process. Before you start blurting it out <coughs> to the people. Before you start blurting it out, or whilst you're blurting it out. So actually sharing that letter with someone else and having them analyze what you've said, think about it, stress test it, and reply to you can actually shift your opinions on things uh, in a way that I don't think social media tends to do. On social media, uh, I think the the cultures that exist there are so tribal that the impulse to criticize or to shut down or to troll is is so strong and that the way that those platforms are designed doesn't tend to doesn't create a space for thoughtful commentary uh, and that's what that is all about it's just creating a place that tries to mimic the conditions in the real world that create thoughtful conversation yeah no, and i like especially that you can't write a letter on your phone because yeah. right now that's the main way that we you know you get a bit wound mm -hmm. up about something and you get on your phone and you can quickly express your opinion and that may be pretty like yeah very full of emotion rather than mm. maybe thought and uh, yeah a bit of breathing room between exchanges i think is also useful so i might write a letter to someone and then it might be three or four days before their reply comes through and that means that they've had time to digest what i've said as opposed to reacting instantly and part of that, i think that initial impulse to react instantly comes from the sense that you're playing to your crowd. You, on Twitter, you get incentivized, at least in certain places, for snarky, sort of biting commentary and not actually considering what's being said and trying to advance the conversation. Being constructive. Yeah, being constructive and thoughtful isn't something that those platforms um, optimize for. Yeah. yeah. I guess what sort of topics have you had people discussing? Um, it's fairly wide ranging. Um, so we have people commenting on everything from something as esoteric as panpsychism consciousness through to what's, parent. What's panpsychism? Oh, it's the idea that uh, consciousness exists sort of fundamentally and universally. Like this table is conscious in some way. Uh, I'm sure it's alive. It's, it's, this is Mark, the table. <laughs> so, so if, yeah, this is Mark and that's Fred, the other table over there. So I'm sure they've got some, they've got feelings. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you say so, Ben, <laughs> uh, who might argue? Uh, yeah, well, but just on, so I guess on some maybe uh, less mentally demanding topics, let's, why don't we talk about rugby? Sure. Um, keen to get your thoughts, especially as a guy that, well, sorry, there's so much commentary now about obviously the state of the game and, you know, used to have the glory days of Australian rugby. I guess, mm. obviously, you're growing up in South Africa. First one to get, what is your... How did you perceive or how was rugby perceived, Australian rugby, when you were growing mm. up in South Africa? How were we, as a rugby nation, perceived? Mm, yeah, it's a good question. Because, I, I mean, I made my decision to move out here uh, for a bunch of factors. But one of them was just being excited about the way that rugby was run here. And how the results were driven. I remember flying out here, as like, I think I was 20, 19 or 20, and spending a week uh, observing the Brumbies before I signed my contract. And going into the team meetings and 
just being blown away by the difference between how those team meetings were conducted and the ones that I was used to in South Africa. Uh, it was such a collaborative, um, argumentative, um, very non-hierarchical, flat um, culture in the sense that there was an expectation that you had an opinion as to how the team was going to be run, or what, what we were going to do, or how we were going to play. It didn't matter if you were you know, a 21-year-old guy in the first, your first year of your contract or 100 test wallaby, everyone had a seat at the table and was expected to offer something. I really found that to be... <laughs> I guess how could you see that living in South Africa? How could you see that... What well, before I came before I came out here, I think the things that struck me about Australian rugby were just uh, the success, maybe. Is that well, obviously, the how, but why they were successful? I think they played with a lot of intelligence, like the Wallabies uh, in the like late nineties, early two thousands, when they went through that period of tremendous success, were doing different things. They were playing in a new style, like a high um, high number of rucks, quick. Like, um, I don't know what the exact terminology is, but just the the way they were playing was different from what other teams were doing, and they weren't mimicking; they were creating their own way. They were innovating, and I, and I thought that was yeah. It was as a young guy observing that, it was clear that that was their point of difference. You know, when they played South Africa, they weren't going to physically outmuscle them, but they were just smarter, and for probably a variety of reasons, that doesn't seem to be the case now. I don't think Australian rugby can position itself as like a a leader in terms of innovation in the global game. And that's it's a shame. Why do you think that is? I mean, it's a hard question to answer. I think it's probably, like I said, a combination of factors. One of the things that struck me uh, coming out here was when the game had just gone professional, you know, the game only really went professional in 96. I arrived at the Brumbies in 2002, at the end of that year. So the players that I arrived to, the majority of that squad had started playing rugby when it was amateur and then it transitioned into the professional era. So they had degrees, they had work experience, they had full lives outside of the sport and you know, responsibilities and they, they were more rounded people than I think you tend to find in the game now. Kids straight out of school and yeah, I mean, it's, the life experience maybe or? Yeah, well, it's not demanded of them. You know, I think one of the real benefits of the, particularly the Brumbies in the late 90s and early 2000s was that you had a uniquely intelligent group of players that were you know, driven to do things differently um, and to succeed. And they weren't the kind of... There wasn't a playing group that you were going to spoon feed. And they wanted a say in how the things were going to get done. And they were results-driven. Um, so yeah, I think there's, those factors are actually really important. That the fact that those guys have now gone on, if you follow the careers of a lot of those former Brumbies and Wallabies, they've gone on to do things in the world that are really interesting. And I think it's because um, they didn't view rugby as the entirety of their life. There were businesses and there were other opportunities that they wanted to pursue. I remember one of the things that struck me when I first came to the Brumbies was a conversation with Joe Ruff. And he was about to go and spend a season <clears throat> in, Beer, in Beeritz and it struck me as such a strange thing and the kind of conversation I'd never had in South Africa where a player at the peak of his powers was a first pick wallaby was then going to like pack up and go and spend a season in France and in talking to him he, he articulated his reasons why he was doing that and it was really refreshing it was like you know you want to travel and see the world and play in a different culture and you know, all, all those things that I think are important in life he had that grounded, more holistic view of where the game sat in his priorities. And I think it made him a better rugby player because it wasn't like the only thing that was going on for him. Um, it's harder now. I don't necessarily lay all the blame at the feet of the players. The amount of hours you expected to put in, the demands in your body, the travel, the number of games, all these things have gone up. And I think in those days, there was more space in a player's week and in a player's month to explore things outside yeah. of the game. And you would have known this more than anyone because you know, we played through a transition as well. Even though the game was professional, there's levels to professionalism and the level of professionalism that I 
arrived to and that you probably arrived to at the Brumbies and then what that transition to under people like Jake is wildly different in terms of the expectations and the players, like time on site, all the little details that go into performance. To, to compete at the top level now, you really have to be a full-time professional and that's, that is a double-edged sword, I think. Oh, absolutely. Like it, I remember, yeah, from when Jake came was when he brought a guy in called Dean Benton, as we all love and know very well. Snap to DV and he uh, he was the one I think well, for me that really got me to almost 24 hours a day you were thinking about looking mm. after your body yeah. or um, you might not think about rugby specifically but you were thinking about your body and your health and your sleep and your nutrition mm. uh, so that when it came time to do anything on the rugby field um, you were there ready to perform at your mm. best and I guess that um, yeah that's they're definitely lessons I've taken from DV I still Mm. Every day of my life now, he's still mm, trying yeah. to not the snap toe part, but still <laughs> trying to, still trying to imply because he was mad as a cut snake old DB. Well, you need you need these crazy people driving high standards, and you know there's lots of different paths to success. You know, I think one of the things that is really interesting when you look back on your career is that whilst you can do some sort of pattern matching, so all these conditions existed and they produced success. You, there are also instances where those same conditions seem to exist and they, they, didn't, they weren't successful or that there's a different model that can be applied that can also be successful. You know, the 2004 team that won the championship had a very different organizational structure and culture than the team that you and I played in that got to the final in, in 2013. So there's two very different ways to approach um, the pursuit of these goals and I think as a looking back you recognize what a great um learning experience all of that is you know, you're getting to observe different leadership styles different captains different coaches different ceos different team dynamics you've got a younger group with some older players leaving and then you've got a group that has a lot of experienced heads then you've got a group that you know has come out of a, a period of poor results and it really needs their confidence boost and you've got a group that has had, has had too much success for too long and then starts to slip on some of this. And so there's all these dynamics at play and trying to take those lessons and apply them to your life outside of rugby and, and the next things you're doing, I think is something I, I've tried to do more of as you know, I've tried to build a company with my brother. It's trying to look back and go, well, what are the mistakes that were made by me and others in that uh, professional sport environment and how can we avoid some of those? What can we take from that that really applies to our group now um and that what belief part's massive like i'd be lying if i said every time i stepped out on the field played all blacks i thought mm. i was going to win yeah. like or believed i could win or like in any game but yeah how and i think we talked a lot about it at brums towards especially the end of uh, my career we spoke a lot about you can't fake belief mm. like it's something um you just believe or not you can't be told if santa claus exists mm. or not so how do you yeah. They talk a lot about it. how can they get the belief back in the game that one, you know, we can turn it around, but two, good results can follow and that every time players step out on the field, you know, they believe they can win. Yeah, it's interesting because I think the, like the conventional wisdom would suggest you need to believe you're going to win in order to perform at a high level. And I'm now at the point where I'm not sure that's true. I think you need to believe that you've done the work. You've, you're as prepared as you can be. You've ticked every box, that you've left no stone unturned, and that you're you're ready to perform as you're as ready to perform as you're possibly able to be when you step out into the field. I think that's the mind frame that you want to adopt, and that leads to the focus on the process throughout you know the week and the month and the season. What are all the things that you can do to arrive at game day as ready as you can be? With, with the understanding that ultimately the results are something out of your hands. I think believing that you're going to win no matter what can actually undermine preparation to some... Just believing in an outcome. Just believing in an outcome and, and not, you know, not paying attention to the process. And, you know, in, a, in a startup, which is what I'm in now, I think this is especially apparent to me in that when you're doing something new, it's inherently risky. And it's statistically far more likely to fail than it is to succeed. So how do, knowing that, how do you go down paths that are risky and keep going for the length of time through all the trials and tribulations that come up? 
Um, and I think it comes down to when you say belief matters, I think it, what you really need to believe in is the, the mission. Like, why is this an important thing to be doing? Like, why, of all the things I could be spending my time on, is this worthy of the kind of sacrifice that it requires? And maybe you just need to believe that maybe not success is guaranteed, but success is possible. And yeah, more, and more likely. And, and the harder you work, the more likely. Yeah, exactly. Gonna, gonna I think that's a, it's a really important distinction. It's a, I think I heard Elon Musk talking about this, and he was just, you know, he said, I thought we would fail when we ventured into Tesla, and then I thought we would fail when we tried SpaceX, but it's kind of beside the point. If the problem deserves a solution, then whether you fail or not is almost beside the point. You do everything you can to try and succeed because you think it's worth succeeding at. And if you do, you feel grateful that you did, and you put in all the work to do it. And if you don't, well, you, you feel like it was a worthwhile thing to dedicate yourself to because it mattered. Well, and something that well, made especially to us as past players, obviously we have just touched on before, was the state of the game of rugby in Australia and there's mm. so much commentary. And it's very easy for us as past players whose futures don't rely on decisions that rugby yeah. Australia make. But what, I mean, I've written on letter about what I think the path forward is for rugby and a big part of it is go digitally and start streaming. But what's your take on the path forward for the game? Um, you know, yeah, any suggestions? Obviously, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we make without any financial repercussions. So yeah. Rugby Australia's got to make all these decisions knowing that there's people, men and women with families and children and mouths mm. to feed. So mm. any disruption to the current business model of rugby mm. does come with huge Risky. risks and yeah. huge impacts on people's lives. Yeah, I mean, the first thing to say is that yeah, since retiring, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about rugby. You know, it... And part of that has been by design. You know, you've gone into something that's totally different, that has so many challenges that there's not space left to think deeply about other problems, especially as they relate to sport. So the thing that strikes me as an obvious problem within Australian rugby is this kind of repetition of the same systems expecting different results. So it seems to me as though we, we, we tend to engage with the same people when it comes to selecting coaches, picking CEOs. It's a, it's a relatively small group of people from whom the ideas emerge that drive the game. And I, and I wonder, without knowing what the answer is, whether the best strategy is to start looking elsewhere for that, 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 those ideation, that ideation phase. You know, what, what are the ways in which we could advance the game and who should we be engaging to help us well, do where that? Where should we be looking? Where should the game be looking at? Well, I mean, I don't know the answer. The, my first thought is that there are places that aren't directly and people that aren't directly connected to rugby that might be able to provide the most insights here. So people solving things in technology, people with backgrounds in military. I think a diversity of ideas and thought is the most important thing. It's really the only diversity that matters. Um, but I don't know how much we go out and seek it. It doesn't seem to me as that we're doing a good job there. And, and that's really- Is that just time, a time thing? They just don't have time or the energy to do it or whether, or is that a, or we don't need more input? What do you think it is? Well, we haven't been performing uh, you know, at a high level, at least not, not sustained performance. You know, we can win big games here and there, but we're not leading and I think the, we have to ask ourselves why, and if we can't even figure out the right questions, then it's probably an indication that different people need to be involved at all levels at the top of the game. So, you know, who is it that we should be reaching out to? How is it that we can bring them into this? How, how do we solve these? The question is, how do we solve the fundamental problem of a high-performing high performing team? Like, how do we generate that? And I'm not convinced that we're seeking out the right advice to start with. I had this feeling when, at various stages of my career at the Brumbies, when we were selecting new coaches, and we were asking the same panel of former players and stakeholders to make decisions, and then this group had made some really bad decisions along the way, you know, as reflected by the results, and yet they were the same people engaged when we were looking at new coaches. 
Uh, and I think that sort of institutionalized thinking um, that doesn't allow for fresh perspectives is potentially the fundamental problem that Australian rugby has. But that's just my guess. So you're the CEO, Clyde Rathburn, uh, Rugby Australia CEO, 2021. What does the season look like and what? how you, how would you turn the ship around? Well, two ideas. Give yeah. us two ideas. I'd fire myself immediately. I'm not the right yeah. person for the job. Um, and then re- reappoint your brother as CEO, Dane. <laughs> Uh, freight train Dane. I think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if we had unlimited resources and influence on the game, I think constructing some think tanks and bringing a diverse set of thinkers with track records, I think that really matters. I think it actually matters that you've been successful in solving significant problems in different spheres. I think just asking for diversity for the sake of diversity is terrible idea yeah. but if you're going out to get different perspectives finding people that have actually achieved significant success in whatever sp- field they're in I think it really really matters and getting them around a table and at least getting started you know these things never happen overnight there's not going to be a huge turnaround in, in months this is going to be a multi-year process but I think at least feeling confident that we're on the right path, I think is something yeah. that uh, anyone who's interested in the game needs to be convinced of, and I'm not sure that we that we've achieved that yet. No, well, yeah, there's plenty of work to do there. I just wanted to ask you, we sort of had our first question sent in from Michael Woody Woodward from Bungendore. Woody, Brilliant. thanks for your thanks for your question. So he's, he asks, Clyde, what was the toughest conversation you ever had with a coach, and why? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. I think uh, probably a conversation I had with Jake White in 2004. Your so. dad, Jake. <laughs> Your dad, actually. No, no not my dad. Um, <laughs> we yeah, love you, Jake, now, I mate, if you're watching. You know, Jake uh, had gone to great lengths to get me back into Australia, uh, to South African rugby. So the context there was that Jake... Um, visited the Brumbies uh, and Australian rugby in 2003, I think it was, and was in a bit of a fact-finding mission. I think he was exploring his options as a coach. Uh, at that point, he wasn't the Springbok coach, and he was staying at my apartment in Monica, and he got the phone call to invite him to apply for the Springbok coaching job. And up until that point, you know, we were, we were talking one day, and he said, you know, I Having observed the Brumby structure here and just Australia in general, I don't think I would ask you to come back. I don't think you should come back. And then he got the call to become the, the Springbok coach. And I guess here's a seat on the plane next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, got, and got through that process and it was, it was appointed. And then you know, reached out to me and said, you know, I've, I'm going to get the ship in order. There's a lot of change that needs to happen you know, with the Springboks. And I'm confident that if we get the right people, we can do it. And he... he yeah, he really went all out to to try and get me back into South Africa, and it was a really difficult conversation. When I eventually, you know, had to, it would dragged on for months. You know, there was I was getting phone calls from like my childhood heroes, like Francois Pinot phoned me up and you know, um, tried to convince me to return to South Africa, and a number of other people, and there was financial incentives and all this stuff, and it was a really difficult situation for like a, I think I was 21 or 22 at the time to be in because it, you know, it only just left South Africa and all of a sudden my ex-coach was, was the Springbok coach and all these sort of stars had aligned but at the same time I was really loving uh, my time in Australia and playing for the Brumbies and having great success there and was excited about the future here and so I ultimately turned him down. That was a very difficult conversation. He was, he was totally understanding of my decision but it, it was difficult not because of the nature of the conversation, but because of um, the fork in the road moment that it represented. So many times in your life, you know, if you opt for path A or path B, things are going to look radically different. And it was the path A was return to South Africa and try and play for the Springboks and be based, you know, base myself there whilst my family were in uh, Australia because my parents and my brothers were all coming. Do you yeah. have any regret? Obviously, Springboks won the 07 World Cup. Like, I'm not trying to go... 
No, no. Uh, you missed out. Like, I've got plenty of regrets in my career, don't worry. But All right. Is that something I've never asked you? Like, is that something? Uh, not really. I mean, I think the whole concept of regret is fascinating and that you can, you can admit to having wanted to handle things differently or do things differently, but actually be really grateful for mistakes. Um, so that's just a, a side note, but I don't regret staying in Australia. It's the best decision I've ever made. Um, you know, my you wouldn't have met me otherwise, mate. I know. We've never been to this to the Delta. How again, serendipitous that's uh, about to be. <laughs> Lucky you, um, mate. Look, yeah, yeah. Now you're stuck there, mate, to me. <laughs> <laughs> so all these things, I mean, the, the friendships you make along the way, uh, the lifestyle we have here, you know, it's, I think it's one of the luckiest places on, on the planet Earth. Um, and I wouldn't live anywhere else. You know, if someone gave me a billion dollars today, my life would look very similar. Um, yeah, I'd probably get, get things done quicker uh, with the company, but I am extremely happy uh, to be living here and, and grateful. So, and that's looking at your life holistically. Obviously, it would have been great to win a World Cup and all those things, but those, when you actually review your career, these individual moments and accolades and team success, they matter, but they matter within a, a much broader context. And the things that you really take away are you know, the shared experiences, the friendships, you know, the, all the highs and the lows and all that stuff, the recovering from injuries, the coming back, like all of that stuff you wouldn't change because it's so impactful in learning, I think, fundamental life lessons that if you just made the right call um, every time, it would be a much, more, much less interesting story. Yeah. And I still try and approach life that way now. You know, what is when I'm presented with decisions that seem consequential, is to ask myself, what is the most interesting story here? If I was reading this as a book to my son one day or yeah, to anyone, which story is going to be most compelling and most interesting? And I think that's helped me take more risk than I think I would otherwise have taken if I was just trying to live the most comfortable... Um, Straightforward life. Yeah, like... A, objectively successful life. You really have to define success by your own terms and uh, yeah, no regrets. So was that, was that decision hard basically because you just felt like you may be turning your back on your country a little bit or you obviously wanted to go with your family and you're excited. Brunt yeah, it was, a was bunch of com- it was difficult because it was competing impulses. It was, you know, not wanting to let, being excited that Jake was a coach and, and being confident that he was going to make some massive changes and stuff. A lot of the reasons I left were because I was not confident in the leadership and the political system and obviously lifestyle reasons, you know, like crime, Safety. violence, those things are everyday factors in South Africa in a way that they're not here. And those, those were definitely part of my decision making. And so it's weighing all these things up in the way the IRB works is, as you know, once you've represented one country at test level, you're essentially locked in there. And I don't want to be in a situation where I played a test for South Africa and then had to spend 10 years there or however long my career was in South Africa whilst my family lived in Australia. So it was, it was all these, I think it was a lot of things to weigh at a very young age uh, with no clear right or wrong answer. But I've got to say that when I decided to stay in Australia in rugby, uh, it was a huge relief. It was, it was just like, just the fact that that decision-making fatigue was now gone and I'd made a decision, made a call. Uh, and it, with the time that it happened, it was also a really exciting time. I think I had that conversation with Jake one or two days before the Brumbies played the Chiefs in the Super Rugby semi-final in Hamilton. And so I made the decision, and then two weeks later, we won the final in Canberra. And everything was a, such a roller coaster speed uh, with my career in those days. And got picked for the Wallabies a few weeks after that, and then you're playing England. And like every week, something, it, it was just... I guess you've indicated your decision pretty quick. You come in, you yeah, at least the, title, you're playing for the Wallabies all within yeah. sort of 12 months. But the, you know, over the, if you look at it just over the, the entire arc of it, who knows what would have happened if I'd gone back. It's, it's impossible to say. Um, and I guess on that story, you, know, you, you retired. This is when we first started, when we first met. Mm. You were always bloody injured. <laughs> soft. <laughs> soft. And, uh, yeah. uh-huh. the, and then retired, sort of, uh, yeah. it was your last game for the hours, that you fractured your face or something. Yeah, and yeah, lots of injuries. Playing, playing for the mighty hours, and, you, um, and you've publicly spoken about mm. your, your battles mentally, especially during yeah, that time. Yeah. A lot of people are doing it really tough at the moment. Yeah. Um, we went through a really tough time of having to shut up shop for uh, the first few weeks of uncertainty um, when the pub was closed and we didn't know, you know how we are going to 
you know, look after our staff. I mean, thank, mm. luckily the, the government stepped up with JobKeeper, but mm. when you were retiring, when you retired for that first time, because um, you probably got better at retiring your second time around, <laughs> second crack at it. It's a practice. <laughs> Just practice. But when, with that first time retiring, how, how was that like mentally, the transition? I mean, oh, really people difficult. always, you know, it's hard for athletes retiring. Yeah, it was really difficult because at my retirement, I think, I mean, again, there's lots of different paths your career can take. And the way my first retirement happened it was one of the worst ones you could take. I think I was 27, so it wasn't, it wasn't like I was at the, you know, the prime of my career or I'd had a particularly long one. It wasn't on my own terms. It was entirely enforced by injury and not just injury one catastrophic you know, career ending injury, but injuries that had just accumulated over years. So I think I started having in significant injury issues only one or two seasons into my career in Australian rugby and they just compounded. So it was frustrating, not just when I had to retire, but years leading up to it, I had like do all kinds of issues. And when I finally retired, it was very much the sense that I'd never got anywhere near to reaching the potential I had as a player that you know, I, all the things that I wanted to achieve in my career, very few of them had been achieved. And I felt as though, you know, if someone had said to me, you're going to be 27 and retired when I was 22 and everything was going perfectly, I would have thought they were crazy, but it can happen relatively quickly. So I think you put all those factors together and also not really being prepared to move into that next phase of life. I think having done stuff to lay the groundwork for whatever that next phase looks like is really important. And, and I had done some of that, I owned a business, a few other things, but I wasn't passionate about those things. I think that's really the key. I think one of the reasons that players struggle when they retire and why I struggled initially was because I think it was a sense that the best years of my life existed in the sport. And that now that I was retired, things might never be as good as they were when I was playing. I think that was the overarching sense that I had it was like oh well the glory years are behind you you're 27 from now on it's never going to be that good and I think the difference between the first retirement and the second retirement is that I was as excited if not more about the next phase of life as I was when I was first entering into professional sport and, and it's hard to develop that I think it, it you know you got to be lucky um, to find something that you're equally interested in and that you want to pursue um, and then I think it was just a convergence of factors. You know, I think I, when I retired, I really just retreated into myself, stopped connecting with friends and family, didn't really talk about the, the issue. Ate lots of chocolate. Uh, I, I do remember quite a few boxes of. Yeah, had quite a few. Uh, so my brother was selling these, <laughs> these charity, uh, these boxes of charity chocolates, at the time. Um, and I would just, uh, this is like a few weeks after the uh, surgery to put a, a metal plate in my face. I would like wake up, take a painkiller and some sleeping tablets. I was just like on all the drugs. Go into his bedroom, get a box of these Fredo Frog chocolates that he was selling for charity. And over the course of the day, just absolutely murder a box of Fredo Frog chocolates. <laughs> Sounds like a great day. Well, I mean, it's, it's not bad. <laughs> for one day. <laughs> but it's not really not sustainable. Months, yeah, not for the three or four months that I did that. So. Yeah, and I think it's when you don't know how to emerge from difficult times, you don't have the tools, you tend to stay in them for longer. And for me, getting well again was relatively simple. It was really basic stuff like uh, I remember going for a walk around the block and then going for a very slow jog around the block and then getting back into the gym and then getting starting to focus on eating healthy foods and getting better sleep and like, connecting with friends and family and getting into nature and getting some sun, like all these, they seem like incredibly basic lifestyle factors and they are, but keeping all those balls in the air simultaneously, I think is the challenge. Uh, and as soon as I started doing that, it just got momentum into the next thing. And you know, that's what allowed me to come back and play two more seasons. So it was just a super valuable uh, experience in hindsight, but very difficult. Yeah, there's, that's one thing we try to talk with the staff, like trying to, Got a Strava group trying to get people to sort of try and stay active. I know it's yeah. the last thing people want to be told when they're feeling like shit is to mm. get outside and go you know, hit the gym or go, well, you can't hit the gym, but go for a run. But mm. um, Yeah, I think you just have to figure out what, what it is that's fundamental to your well-being. What it is that you, you and, and I, think it's, I think intuitively people know what they really need. Um, but for a variety of reasons, we neglect that. And I think that that's, 
that's the thing is that it doesn't life's never going to be perfect all the time there's always going to be challenges and ups and downs and i think the the lesson is that you want a framework that you can revert to to say okay well no matter what's happening in my life if i adhere to these things at least loosely 80 percent of the time whatever it is things are gonna be pretty good if i i don't know for me if i'm exercising getting decent sleep i've got a 20 month at old uh, month at home now so that's that's proving difficult but you don't have to get all these things right all the time but at least i know what my framework is i know if i'm exercising getting decent sleep eating good food um, doing work that I really believe in and, and passionate about. And if I'm not doing these things, I don't expect to be feeling 100%. But if I'm doing all that stuff, getting out into nature, like learning new skills, um, trying to solve important challenges, I think these things are fundamental to me. And they might be slightly different for other people. There's probably some overlap. But I think actually thinking about what your personal, uh, and I hate this sort of uh, corporate speak, but like your well-being plan is, I think thinking about what that looks like is really important so that you've got some boxes that you know you can tick at any given time that if you do, you'll, you're likely to feel well no matter what the, circ- the external circumstance can change, but the things that you can actually control make a huge difference. I can't agree with you more because we were like, lucky that sort of back end towards our career there was you know, a lot of data and mm. we'd have in the team room after a big week of pre-season they'd have who ran X kilometres. Yeah. So I sort of knew, oh yeah, right, we roughly do front rowers do 20, 25 kilometers a week worth of running. Mm, running. And I sort of knew, yeah, it was, except for Dan Palmer. It's, well, it's, Palmer. A, it's a waddle. Really. Oh, yeah. waddle. 25 kilometers a week of waddling. But I knew that's when, like I, I'd learned towards the back end of my career when I'd have a holiday, when well, we'd mm. have our, our break. After about two or three weeks in the break, I would start feeling off. Mm. And I'd always return probably yeah. a week early and the coach going, oh, Benny A is dedicated. But no, I just needed to get back because yeah. rugby was the only thing that got me exercising and staying active was mm. was be exercising with my mates but mm. that was yeah what that framework that you're saying is i sort of knew oh my whole career i've been running about 20 25 kilometers a week yeah. and i felt good when i did it <clears throat> so sort of using that yeah i've, I've tried to stick with that even yeah, whatever it is time. whatever it is i think i think the the plan that matters is one that is sustainable and that it can be different for different people i think that's the thing is like this advice that I'm giving is essentially saying, this is what worked for me. And some of it might work for you, some of it might not, but it's worth running some experiments to figure out what, it, what those things are for you. And then just being disciplined uh, about keeping them in place. Oh, Rath, really appreciate your time. Um, anyone wants to connect with you or have a discussion about rugby or anything we've just um, discussed? Where should they go? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of checking out Letter, uh, the website is letter.wiki. Um, I'm on Twitter at, I think, Clyde Rathbone. I think it's right. Uh, but people can email me if they've got questions about the company. Uh, Clyde at karma dot... Dot wiki, is it? Wiki, yeah. W I K R. And there's a rugby community group chat on there. There's a few of us. Yeah, so if you search for rugby community on Letter, uh, you can find all the conversations about that. Uh, in that place and you can start a conversation with anyone um, about anything relating to that community so hope to see people on there and we hope to see everyone hopefully soon when we uh government lets us open back up and in here for a beer and more conversations and we might let you in clive when you come <laughs> i look forward to jesus thanks very much thanks mate, mate. thanks Benny.